Yay, we are back online. And actually, it's just as well. I get to upgrade my hard drive to a one terabyte. So I'm actually not all that disappointed. But uh, I also was able to recover my wiring diagrams for Toyota air fuel sensor circuits, which I believe are going to come in handy. But as a refresher here, when we last left off, my computer died when I determined that this car has a new engine and that some significant wiring was done by a shop. And we have every reason to suspect that we may have some wiring problem here. So let's go ahead and get our scan tool set up again. And I think the strategy here is before we go ahead and start assuming that this is wired wrong, let's go ahead and see if we can verify if maybe the wiring is correct and all that we have is just a bad oxygen sensor uh, or air fuel sensor, sorry. Maybe the air fuel sensor was damaged or something or the donor engine air fuel sensor was used and it was bad, who knows. But uh, let me go ahead and set this up. Okay, so let's get back to our O2 sensor trace. Let's pull up that wideband sensor again. Make sure we duplicate our problem. And we can see that we definitely do. God, it almost looks like a square wave, doesn't it? That's just, that's just sick. But uh, we know when we fix that, that we should be seeing a straight line right at 3.3 volts. And we'll get there soon enough. Um, also our equivalence ratio. Okay, so again, we can see dramatic. Uh, the um, lambda sensor is over here. Just a huge shift. Um, just all the way lean, all the way rich. Definitely, definitely an issue here. So what I want to do is to see if this is a problem with the circuitry or wiring or PCM even. I'm going to go ahead and do some variables. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to go ahead and pull a vacuum hose off this engine and let's see if we can get this thing to go lean. Okay, you can hear the hiss of the vacuum and check it out, we go lean. We do go lean. So that is interesting. All right, I just want to go back and see if we've got some um, fuel trim correction for that. All right, so let's pull that short-term fuel trim and uh, absolutely that looks normal. That's good. Um, so let's go ahead and I think that's just from switching screens, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, we, but but this is concerning here that, that we're stuck at five um, and a, a 1.23, so that is just crazy. But we are getting computer response to it uh, with that fuel trim, which doesn't appear maxed out. Let me go ahead and just bring up the long term just to see that it's responding as well, and it definitely is. Okay, I went ahead and connected that hose again. Um, the other thing I want to do before I do a propane test, let's go ahead and do our snap throttle test. Uh, in order to do that, it's going to be a little bit better if we pull this graph up, I believe. Um, so let me... Alright, I'm just going to go ahead and pull up a larger graph so it's easier to see the results of our snap throttle test. Um, so, wow, <laughs> that is just crazy. Let me go ahead and get rid of this long-term fuel trim here. Okay, so what we want to do is a snap throttle test now. Uh, this is another test for the sensor as well as circuitry to the PCM. Remember from the air fuel sensor video that when we do the snap throttle test, we're going to see a quick rich and then a quick lean and then a stable out. Okay, um, well, it did go lean for some time, but we don't have nearly what we are expecting. Let me go ahead and pull up that diagram of what we would expect. Okay, so this is what we were looking for here. You notice we've got on a snap throttle, we're gonna have an immediate extreme rich response followed by an immediate extreme lean response and then stabilizing out and that is not what we saw on this air fuel sensor. Well, I mean, it's hard to tell because we already have that happening anyway. 
Um, but uh, what I think I may do, because we did see a sustained lean response on it, maybe I can sustain the wide open throttle just a little bit without blowing this engine and see if we can sustain a rich here. So let me try that. <sighs> well, kind of afraid to hold the throttle down too much because it doesn't have a rev limiter. Uh, let me try one more time, but we seem to sustain the lean with no problem, but I don't know that I can sustain the rich. Well, actually, I can. I just don't want to blow this lady's engine that she just got replaced, but it does look like at about 5,500 sustained, we can sustain a rich, but it, it certainly doesn't stabilize out. Now, the fact it doesn't, that's, that's hard to explain. It responds rich as it should. It responds lean as it should, but it does not stabilize out. That, to me, is actually indicating a bad air fuel sensor. That is not indicative that this is going to be a computer problem. Yeah, this is going to be a problem with the air fuel sensor is what's happening here, that it has an internal failure to be able to maintain a stoichiometry is what's happening here. So maybe this isn't actually a wiring problem after all. So the one thing we've got to do, let's see what happens when we add some propane. So let me go ahead and get that vacuum line off and we're going to add some propane to it. Okay, there goes our vacuum line, and I'm just gonna plug it for a second. Let's just verify we go lean, and we do. And then let me go ahead and put propane right into the vacuum line. So adding propane directly to the intake and check that out. It does indeed go immediately rich. So what does this tell us? This tells us that there is indeed feedback to the PCM. Let me go ahead and remove it and the PCM responds appropriately. Okay, so what I want to do now is I'm just curious to see if I can get any kind of proportional change in the fuel trim by inducing the variables. So uh, the first thing, let me go ahead and bring this to a much more realistic scale. And the reason is because uh, it is very apparent to me, and I think you'll agree, that this is indicating a bad air fuel sensor. This is not indicative at all that we've got a communication problem to the PCM or a PCM problem. So let's go ahead and reset that scale so we maximize our fuel trim. We can see that the fuel trim percentage over here is quite jumpy. Let me see if I can get that to be a little more proportionate by inducing a small vacuum leak. All right, so here's our full out vacuum leak. And of course we maximize the fuel trim. Let me bring it back down by plugging. And then I'm gonna introduce a small vacuum leak and see if it's proportionate. So here's a small vacuum leak. No, it's all the way. There is no in between. Could equally validate this by looking at the injector pulse width. So let me see if we've got that as a option here. So in blue now, we've got injector pulse width. And again, what I'm looking to do is see if I can get a proportional response with the injector pulse width, or if this is just strictly responding all or none to our varying voltage. And actually, I've got equivalence ratio on here, but it's the same thing. Uh, you know, it still gives the same output. We're going, this up here would be lean, this down here would be rich. All right, let me wait for that fan to shut off. There we go. And let's go ahead and induce that vacuum leak again. All right, we're gonna do a, just a tiny vacuum leak. All right, this is just a tiny vacuum leak. And we can see that there's just, there's just all or none response on this here. This is a bad air fuel sensor. There's no question in my mind about that. Given the variables though that we know with this thing having uh, whatever they did to make this harness work on this engine, um, I. 
I'm really confident. Now, remember, my policy is that if I'm wrong about this being an air fuel sensor, if I'm wrong about that, then I have to pay for it. And the trouble is the air fuel sensor for this car is almost $300. So I really need to be 100% sure. All right, so if I'm going to be 100% sure that all that's wrong with this car is the air fuel sensor, because the other thing is I don't want there to be a problem with the air fuel sensor and a problem with the wiring. So I go back to the customer and do that thing. Oh, I replaced the air fuel sensor because it was bad. But then when I replaced it and it was bad, then I found you have this other problem. That's what a parts changer does as an excuse when they change the wrong part. I'm positive this thing needs an air fuel sensor, but here's how I'm going to be sure. Uh, what I've done is I've got the wiring diagram here. All right, let me go ahead and get this in view here. And what we've got is the air fuel sensor here. This is going to be the monitoring chamber right here where the magic happens. Basically, this is like a sample chamber, and it's flanked by a negative and positive uh, current, which can change polarity based on whether we're um, rich or lean from stoichiometry within that pump chamber there. And basically what I'm thinking is uh, the negative wire here, we've got white. On the positive wire, we've got an orange. And what I'm thinking of doing is if we can put just a very small amount of voltage to the positive and negative to complete this circuit, and we cover this, why this is not going to blow the PCM over on the Schrodinger's Box Quantum Mechanics channel. But what I want to do is go ahead and send a signal to the PCM, see that the PCM reads that signal. If the PCM reads that signal, I am done. We're putting an air fuel sensor into this thing. And if the PCM does not accurately read that signal, uh, well then, um, not only do we have some kind of issue there, but it also makes me question whether the air fuel sensor is bad. So that's the only test that I can come up with that I can really be positive about this. So let me go ahead and try that. All right, guys, check this out. This is going to be quite the contraption and uh, new milestone for the channel, I'm sure, with what I'm about to try here, which I do not recommend you try at home. But by my calculations, uh, we are not going to blow the PCM doing this. And again, this is explained on my other channel, Schrodinger's Box Quantum Mechanics. I'll put a link to it. But what I've got here is I've got a 1.5 volt battery uh, where I've got some extensions for the plus and minus here. And what I've done is I've backed probe the leads flanking the monitoring pump on the AF negative and AF positive. And I've also got a test light here. So what I am going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, this I believe is the negative. Let me see. Um, I'm pretty sure I put the red to the positive on the battery. Um, so we're going to go ahead and connect this up here. And then we're going to put our test meter in series with this. Man, I'm going to have to get a cover for that exhaust that they left open. That sucks. That is so hot. Um, and uh, I've got my scan tool set up here with volts for the O2 sensor, the wideband O2 sensor. You can see we're obviously unplugged, so we're at our 3.3 because of the bias. And what we're going to do is I'm going to put uh, some current up to the PCM. Uh, the PCM, let's see, it should interpret this as a uh, rich signal, right? So uh, let's go ahead and do this and see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and touch this test light here, and we can see that it is indicating that it is rich. Absolutely. And notice that it is proportionate, um, so I'm not getting a full zero signal. Okay, and then just to test that, I'm going to go ahead and put a resistor here. And uh, this will probably cause a full rich, I imagine. Let's see. Yeah, it does cause a full rich. So we have proportionate response. Uh, the other thing, remember that these are polarity changing devices, air fuel sensors. So I can go ahead and change polarity here. Verify that now we go lean. Let's verify we go lean. We do. We go lean. What does this tell me? This tells me that the PCM is not the problem. We have communication to the PCM, and the PCM is interpreting proportionate signal. There is no other scientific explanation for this. This air fuel sensor is the only thing that is bad. All right, we've got the new oxygen sensor installed. You can probably actually hear. Let me give you a listen. But it is no longer doing that hunting. That is a really good sign. Let's make sure we've got uh, stoichiometric reading. All right, I can already tell this thing sounds so much better. It's just absolutely smooth as silk. Haven't driven it yet, but uh, 
We'll go ahead and do that before we close the video. Let me go ahead and get this thing set up. Let's go right to the sensor voltage. We're looking for 3.3. Look at that. <laughs> Unbelievable. And it's steady. Okay, the only other thing we want to do is pull up an equivalence ratio here, of course, and verify uh, stoichiometry. And we've already done that actually through the voltage, but I just want to go ahead and do this as a second resource. Where would that be? Okay, there it is right there. Equivalence ratio. And again, we're hovering right about one. So actually, I got to give props to the engine installer. While it's certainly not the most professional installation of an engine, at least it is done correctly and it certainly is a good engine. I also want to go ahead and just do one more thing. Uh, let me just make sure this reacts to variables. It's kind of late at night now, so I really don't want to do the snap throttle test right now. But let me just go ahead. I've got my propane here. Let's add some propane into the intake right there and verify that we get a change. And we can see that it is indeed going rich. Awesome. Okay, that's all I need to see. This thing is fixed. I'm just going to go ahead and take it for a test drive. All right, well, I just took the car on a pretty healthy test drive, and it drove perfectly fine to me. No more of that surging and fading, and it absolutely had perfectly normal throttle response, no check engine light. So that is definitely a fix, and all it was was that air fuel sensor that both the professional mechanics were thrown off, obviously, because of no check engine light. But I have to say, it does look like the installation of the engine. The guy did a pretty good job, um, well, relatively, and the wiring shop did everything right. Uh, so I guess I'll maybe see if I can give them a call, have them stop blaming each other, let them know that the do-it-yourselfer got it all fixed for them. But the bottom line with all this is, of course, the most important lesson. And that is when you're confronted with a difficult diagnosis like this where you're not sure where to get direction, the thing to do is to start with a visual inspection when you have absolutely no idea what the hell you're going to be looking for. Wait, no, that's not the lesson.